unbelievable discovery. This is it. This is absolutely it. A mind-boggling claim. The tomb of Jesus found. Jesus' body would have been laid right here. An unprecedented controversy. Quite frankly, you know, give me a call when somebody's got the real evidence on something like this. Can 21st century technology deliver that evidence? We're actually pushing the bounds of archaeology. And now, will a second tomb provide the ultimate proof? What's that? Oh, oh, oh. That's it, baby. And that is a symbol of Christian resurrection. It's one of the most iconic images in Christianity. In the spring of 30 AD, Jesus is crucified in Jerusalem by the Roman authorities. The Gospels agree that Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy member of the Jerusalem High Court and a secret follower of Jesus, takes possession of the body. But what happens next is not so clear. Christians believe that Jesus is placed in a tomb close to the site of crucifixion, and after three days, he rises from the dead, leaving behind an empty tomb. Tradition holds that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is built on this site. But no archeological evidence for Jesus' tomb has ever been found here. Another account based on the Gospel of Matthew states that Jesus is ultimately buried in an unused tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had intended for his own family. But again, no evidence for such a tomb is found. All this changes in 1980. In the Jerusalem suburb of Telpiot, two miles from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, archaeologists uncover a 2,000-year-old tomb. It has strange markings, unlike anything previously discovered. The archaeologists remove 10 limestone ossuaries, or coffins, from inside. Then the tomb is cemented over, an apartment complex built on top. But in 2007, filmmaker Simha Yakubovich rediscovers the tomb. It's unbelievable. A new analysis of the archaeology leads Simha to a startling conclusion. He's convinced that he has found the Jesus family tomb. He bases his radical theory on the fact that six ossuaries found in the tomb are inscribed with names associated with Jesus and his family. There is a woman called Maria Mene. This is a Greek version of Mary. It's been suggested that this unique spelling is associated only with Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' most celebrated companions. There is also a Maria, Mary in English, a name identified with Jesus' mother, and a Yose, a nickname associated with one of Jesus' brothers. Most surprisingly, in this cluster of names, there is also a Jesus, son of Joseph. Though the implications are shocking, some scholars are open to the possibility. All the tombs around Jerusalem are slowly getting exposed and in some cases destroyed. So it's not so far-fetched that a construction crew would have uncovered the tomb of Jesus. I think we have to consider it, that this Talpio tomb might be the tomb of the family of Jesus. When the story breaks, not everyone is so open to that possibility. This is uh, front page news. It's on all the evening broadcasts. This is very much the talk of Jerusalem. For me, it represents the worst kind of biblical archaeology. I don't see the evidence for it anywhere. I'm going to base my beliefs on the scriptures, which hold together far better than the kind of farcical documentary we're talking about here. As the controversy rages, Simha and his team shift their focus towards another archaeological site, one he hopes will provide additional evidence to back up his claims. It's a second tomb, located less than 200 feet away from the alleged tomb of Jesus. I think we got a tomb. So this is where we're going. It's perfect. This tomb was discovered in 1981 when drilling at a construction site accidentally exposed it. Archaeologists entered through a hole in the tomb's ceiling. They took some notes and made a rough map of the burial cave. 
Orthodox religious groups, believing that any modern intrusion disturbs the dead, forced the archaeologists out of the tomb. But not before they took these recently found black and white photos. The tomb was once again sealed. For religious purposes, a pipe was installed into its roof. In 2009, cement was poured down the pipe, barring access to the tomb. But it still serves as a marker that the tomb is somewhere beneath this area of the apartment complex. Simha and his team believe this second tomb may belong to some of Jesus' earliest followers, possibly even of Joseph of Arimathea. The two tombs were found on a hill set apart from the other burial caves in the area. They appear to be on a first century rich man's estate, complete with wine press and ritual bath. And there are clues here that this hill in Telpiat was a sort of hub in the wheel of religious and political power. Behind you is uh, Herod's Herodium, which is Herod's tomb, Herod the king of the Jews. And then if I turn around this way is the temple in Jerusalem. And then behind me, it's called the Hill of Evil Council. And it's the traditional spot where the priests were meeting to condemn Jesus. And so you have to wonder whether this location might have more of a meaning than just hearing, oh, a tomb was found in Talpiot in some apartments. It seems to have sort of a strategic meaning. Simha is becoming convinced that modern Talpiot is Joseph of Arimathea's estate. What's more, in Hebrew, Arimathea means two hills. And this area in Talpiot is still dominated by two hills. If Simha can find evidence that this second tomb belongs to Joseph of Arimathea, that would go a long way towards backing up his original claim that just 200 feet away is the Jesus family tomb. The first challenge is how to get into the tomb under this building. Then we can crawl in this way. I see. But before their search gets yeah, we underway, chaos. The Haredim are an ultra-Orthodox Jewish group, and they don't want the dead disturbed. They managed to shut down the excavation, as they did with the original exploration back in 1981. Simha and fellow producer Felix Kolyvev go to the center of Haredi life to meet the rabbi in charge of the activists who disrupted the investigation. They need to arrive at some sort of compromise. After hours of negotiations behind closed doors, the Haradim agree to a limited exploration of the tomb, as long as Simha and Felix always let them know what they are doing and never touch the bones of the dead. With the problem behind them, Felix gets hold of the map drawn when the tomb was originally discovered in 1981. They know it's not 100% accurate, and they're not sure where exactly under the apartment building the tomb is located. But it can't be far from the original pipe. That's great. They are now convinced that at least part of the tomb lies underneath this corridor. But are they right? They know exactly how to find out. Ground penetrating radar, or GPR. GPR works by sending a radar signal below the surface, detecting unusual materials, or in this case, a void. The GPR scans the entire corridor, looking for an unusual space beneath the tiles. Felix's calculations lead him to one tiny corner. This is a magic corner. Did you see anything? There is something there. You can see here, the edge of the void. Along the short of it, is Felix right where he thinks we can put our uh, 
probe. A probe? Yes, yes, he's right. There is an area approximately 60 centimeters along the wall and about 40 centimeters away from the wall. So in other words... Felix believes the only way into the burial cave is through a space not much bigger than a sheet of paper. They may have found the tomb. Now they have to find a way to get in. With the use of ground-penetrating radar, Simha, Felix, and their team have located a first-century Jesus-era tomb under a Jerusalem building. But they don't know how to access it. So we have to find a way of getting in. We answer that the team has been joined by historian James Tabor and archaeologist Rami Arav, who was not previously involved in the Jesus family tomb investigation. They have received official permits to explore the tomb. The idea will be to dig here in the corner. So because of their compromise with religious activists, they must find a way to explore the burial cave without going in themselves. The solution may be in this small warehouse in Canada. They enlist the help of Walter Klassen, a legendary builder of animatronics as well as robotic camera platforms for film and television. We do all the software, the electronics, all the hardware is done here in-house. In Walter's challenge is to build a robotic arm mounted with a camera that can fit through a small drilled hole. The device must also be maneuverable enough to allow the team to document every inch of the tomb and the ossuaries inside. I had an architect take this floor plan and drawing of the tomb and superimposing on each other. Mm -hmm. Felix has a rough idea of the tomb's dimensions. What's your guesstimate again as to uh, how high the tomb is? I, I would say from one meter to a meter and a half. That's kind of difficult because the height limits me on how I can get something in, tilt it up, and then go forward. One other thing you will have to consider is if we do go in here... Remote camera expert Bill Tarrant shows Walter the camera he intends to use to record the images from the cramped three and a half foot high burial chamber. How heavy is this? It's about four pounds. Oh, so we're gonna have to carry this at the end of a three or four meter yeah. Uh, arm. Yeah, so it's gonna be The camera pounds, is in a right? tough right. metal housing and it's heavy. Oh, I see it. That's but if they get into the tomb and it's related to Jesus's earliest followers, what might they find? What would an early Christian symbol look like? Simha travels to Rome, one of the few places on earth where such early Christian symbols can still be seen. The catacombs are miles and miles of Christian burials that run under the streets of the city. Robin Jensen, an expert on early Christian art, points out the earliest Christian symbols. In this place, in this particular catacomb, this would be one of our earliest pieces. How early can you take it? Cannot be much earlier than the fourth century. Here, we see three of the earliest Christian symbols. The key rho, the first two Greek letters of the word Christos. The anchor, a symbol of faith. And the fish with scales and gills, a symbol of the Christ. But the most popular biblical image for Christians in the catacombs is Jonah and the whale. Oh, wow. Here we have Jonah. Jonah is Christian? Absolutely. This story is a very important story for funeral art in particular, and it's the most popular. Why is it the most popular? It tells the story of death and resurrection. Jonah, like Jesus, dies, and he's resurrected when he's regurgitated. Spat out. As he spat out. And so that's even in the New Testament. It's a sign of Jesus' death and resurrection. So when you see Jonah being spat out, that's a quintessential Christian symbol until about the middle of the fourth century. And then he disappears. After months of preparation, the team gathers in Jerusalem in an attempt to crack Christianity's ultimate secret. 
you're setting a little bit of history. We've got police, we've got the Israel Antiquities Authority, we've got religious supervision, we've got the Tenants Association. So what is the tension? I don't want tension, I want discovery. It's working? Perfect. So, step one, small little hole. Six centimeters? Yes, special. If we're in the right place, then we go to step two. 20 centimeters, 80 Walking inch. Nice. All right, great. Let's do it. They have already drilled two feet deeper than their calculations suggest. Too much. Yeah. It's possible that they are drilling in the wrong place. In retrospect, I think we should have gone at an angle to begin with. Yeah. Get inside, see where we are, and then putz around with the hole. We could uh, try another meter in the same hole. No, first let's get an angle. And let's then just, do them at the angle. Let's just get in. Let's let's just get have the satisfaction of getting it. Yeah. Let's just get in. They now try drilling at an angle. I'm inside. After years of research and effort, this is the moment they've been waiting for. I see the bottom, nice and clear. Hey, we're right where you said we'd be. Yeah. You were 100% right. They have their entry point into the tomb. But the only way of exploring it is with the robotic arm, which has only been tested in the lab. Walter Klassen now joins the team of archaeologists and investigators in the Jerusalem suburb of Talbiot. His newly created robotic arm is about to be used for the first time. It's been custom designed to explore an ancient tomb that is just below their feet. A tomb that filmmaker Simha Yakubovich believes may be that of Joseph of Arimathea, the man who buried Jesus. The arm is deliberately low tech. Simple levers control its movements. Compressed air is delivered to the controls by rubber hoses, clearly marking every direction. <laughs> the team is moments away from finally unlocking the secrets of the tomb. Okay. Beautiful. Oh, excellent. Look at that. They use two access holes. A smaller camera is placed in one of them and lowered into the tomb first. This will be pointed at the robotic arm to help Walter and Bill orient the arm's movements in the tomb below. Okay, you guys ready? All ready, let's go. Hey guys, the moment of truth. The lightweight articulated arm that can unfold up to 10 feet is ready to be lowered. Is somebody pulling it on the other side? It's all hands on deck to help maneuver it into the eight inch pipe. Keep holding and lowering it down. I feel like a pilot, you know? All right, we have image. Camera expert Bill Tarrant finds his bearing and focuses the lens. Look at that, look at that. stone walls. Inside these are ossuaries filled with human bones. Placed here 2,000 years ago. The robotic arm shows that there are nine burial compartments in this tomb. Four of them have ossuaries inside. They start with the niche that's closest to the door. Traditionally, this niche would house the ossuary of the man who commissioned the tomb. That's it. That's it, that's it. Yeah. Could this niche contain the remains of Joseph of Arimathea? 
the moment has arrived. The camera is slowly maneuvered between the ossuary and the wall. Walter feeds a snake camera down the housing. This camera is more flexible and will be able to get closer to the ossuaries than Bill's HD camera. They're looking for a name or a symbol. If you look at that, it's really ornate, befitting a wealthy person. Two circular rosettes, which are typical of ossuaries, are clearly visible. Most scholars believe that these are simply decorations, but others think that they have some as yet undeciphered meaning. They now notice a design carved into the center of the ossuary. Scholars call this a nephesh, or a pillar. Since the Hebrew word for pillar and rise are the same, it may be a symbolic reference to the afterlife. They continue to scan the ossuary on all sides, looking for new symbols or an inscription. But they find nothing more. They move the camera to the second of the four niches that need exploring. This one contains three ossuaries. Okay, Walter, can you drop down a bit? Okay. And retract a bit. Okay, coming back. Lids have inscriptions. Do you see anything? No, don't you? Inscriptions are not monumental inscriptions. They're not something that someone carved elaborately like those rosettes. They're tags. They're tags. You know, they're moving uncle and they're putting in grandma, and they want to remember who's who. So they, they write almost graffiti-like sometimes. So we've just got to be systematic and careful that we don't kind of zoom by expecting to see some kind of big inscription when it's really some little graffiti. Okay. Can you lower? Yes, I can. This one is nice. And as they reposition, I don't know. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. a discovery. Mu, yeah, yeah. Olive, Ro, Olive, Mara. They are make? He said no, they're Greek. Greek. Where, where do you see? M, A, oh. R, A. They have seen this name before, in the alleged Jesus family tomb, a few hundred feet away. There, one of the Marys is called Mariamene Emara. Meriamene is a particular Greek spelling of Mary that has only been found in two other ancient texts, both associated with Mary Magdalene. Bolstered, the team presses on. But just then, a cable snaps. The camera and the arm are stuck, and there is no way for the team to get them out. The robotic arm sits crumpled, broken at the bottom of a 2,000-year-old tomb. The rope is ripped, the arm is crooked. It's sort of a worst-case scenario. Okay, so it, it was the boom rope that broke? Yes, like the, the, the up, and down. up and down. For designer Walter Klassen, it's a nightmare. Just please, let me think about this. Yeah. I can't talk. Here, pull hard. Wait, 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 slow down. Um. The snapped cable means he can't retract the arm. And the way that it is currently bent means that it won't come up the hole. For several hours, Klassen carefully manipulates the broken arm. The exploration seems to be over before it really begins. I don't know if I can get it out. Have you got the uh, motorized thing zoomed I, out? I'm doing the motorized thing. I'm going to see if I can try to retract the front end. OK. It's oh. coming in, Walter. Yes, I'm seeing it. That's, That's a good sign. Yeah, it's good that it's carrying it. OK, pull on it now, Kevin. Pull. Walter finally gets the broken arm out. Slow, slow, slow. Mr. 
After two hours of surgery, the robotic arm is repaired and it's back in the game. They now position the arm to explore the third niche. It contains a single ossuary. No symbols of any kind, but this niche contains something else. A lot of human skeletal remains. There are no inscriptions here, and no hint of Joseph of Arimathea or anyone else that is related to Jesus. They are running out of options, ossuaries, and niches. They move on to the last niche, and the last two ossuaries to be explored. Archaeologist Ramya Rav now joins the search. I want to look at this one here. Walter, is it possible to go in further? Yes, it is. Let me try it. A lot of years, a lot of money, and a lot of effort have been expended to get to this point. But the clock on this expedition is about to run out. What are we Where are we at now, Walter? I think we're kind of stuck, but we're getting there. What's that? We're looking at the end of the other ossuary. Yes, yes, yes we are. Yes, we are. This is number four. We are looking at number four, correct? Correct. So we're so looking at the front. We are, we are looking at this little piece here of the oh, front. side. So we want Suddenly, Walter spots something unusual. Great. No, 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 let me help you a bit. A cross. Great, great. No, 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 no. Let go me back. See. Did you see the cross there? No. Oh, In the middle. Where the cross is, yes. Where? Go up a bit, Bill. I'm going up. No, 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 no. Slow down, slow down. Okay. There. Where? Yes, that's right. This is the cross. The cross. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Go, go down go. just a bit, yeah, Bill. Go down a bit. Most historians believe the cross became a Christian symbol in the 4th century AD. So finding it in a 1st century tomb doesn't mean anything. But 1st century crosses that may be Christian have been found in Italy, at Herculaneum, in Naples, and by Rami Arav at his excavation site in the Galilee. If the cross was already a Christian symbol in the first century, then the team has just discovered the earliest Jesus-related cross ever found. On ossuaries, there shouldn't be anything which is made just for decoration. The whole thing is symbolic. The whole box is symbolic. The team has finished exploring all but one of the four niches containing ossuaries. So far, they examined five of the seven ossuaries. They hoped to find inscriptions or symbols that could throw light on the alleged Jesus family tomb just 200 feet away. I think we're doing pretty good. We've got a pillar, which could be seen as referencing the afterlife. We have a cross, which I think is a Christian cross. And we have an inscription, Amara, which references the other tomb and can be read as Our Lady. But I don't think it gives any kind of conclusive connection to the Jesus tomb nearby. We've got to have more. In the last of the niches, they continue to explore the ossuary with the cross on it and its neighbor. All right, go back. You, you got control again. The work is painstakingly methodical. You can see on your monitor where you are. But suddenly, it pays off. I see something in, in the ossuary in the back, the one that's blocked by the ossuary in the foreground. Oh! oh, 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 oh. oh. There, there, there. What is that? Whoa. Looking at, I mean, is this the bottom part? This yeah. is the top, and there's this little ball on the bottom. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's a ball here. I'm just going to orient myself. Yeah, and you can see on your monitor where you are. Oh, 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 oh. 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 There, 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 there. Wow, look at that. That is amazing. It's an effort. This is no, the look. bottom. Rami sees the squeezed image and thinks it may be another example of a nefesh, a pillar like the one they found in the first niche. Hey guys, that, that's no pillar. It's definitely something else. I haven't seen anything similar to this. Better, that's better. Actually, there. it looks like What's a that? Bill. Coming, coming. Bill. Now, those could be the handles. 
Look here. Just look here very carefully. But then, a revelation. It's a fish. Wait, of course, it's a whale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fish. It's a whale. It's a whale. It's a whale. It's Jonah. It is. Oh my God! Oh my God! Jonah holding his head. This is That's Jonah's head. Spitting Jonah out. Two legs, two arms, and his head. Yes. He's spitting Jonah out of the whale. That is absolutely it. But that is the symbol of Christian resurrection. The team is convinced that what they are looking at is a great fish spitting out Jonah. Unlike the later Christians of Rome, who depicted Jonah's fish as a sea dragon, Jesus' earliest followers were Jewish. As a result, they depicted the fish here as edible, as kosher, meaning it has scales and fins. According to the biblical book of Jonah, when Jonah is spat out, his head is wrapped in seaweed. Here, they see a stick figure being spat out of a fish, its head purposely marked up by lines. All along the edges of the sanctuary are little fish swimming in the sea. The image is unique. The discovery is revolutionary. Without a doubt, the sign of Jonah was the symbol of Jesus' earliest followers, the symbol of Jesus' resurrection. Because of the clarity of this first century image, its precise meaning can be decoded. For Christians, or Judeo-Christians, believers in Jesus, it comes to mean, like Jonah, Jesus went into death. The fish is death, but came out of death. And on an ossuary, clearly, it's talking about resurrection of the dead. So this is the earliest representation of the resurrection. This is huge. It's, it's absolutely huge. <laughs> this discovery, the earliest Jesus-related symbol ever found, makes the investigators feel that their hunch has paid off, that they now have dramatic evidence that the tomb just 200 feet away from the one they are now investigating is the Jesus family tomb. But can they find more? They proceed to the back of the Jonah ossuary. They see something, but because of the wall, they can't get far enough from the image to tell what it is. They position the camera on the floor, looking up at the lid. The image on the back looks like the tail of a fish, but they cannot be sure. For help, they consult the black and white photos taken by the archaeologists in 1981, before they were chased out of the tomb by religious activists. Here, the image of the fish tail is clear. The fish seems to be diving into the ossuary. The pictures also reveal something else, something unexpected. Today, the Jonah ossuary is not in the same place where it was originally found. Then it was taken out of one niche and placed in the one where it currently rests. Its original location? The first compartment on the right in the so-called Patriarch's niche. Does this bone box hold the remains of Joseph of Arimathea? The evidence is tantalizing, but there's no inscription. There is, however, one last ossuary to explore. First time ever, the team has explored a sealed Jesus-era tomb using a robotic arm. They have discovered a unique image that may have been used by the earliest followers of Jesus. But their search is not over. They have one more ossuary to explore. Hand the boom right. Okay, coming up. So we're looking. So we're now we're surveying three. Number three. We're right there. As they approach the last ossuary, they feel that lightning can't strike twice. But sometimes it does. Oh, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. So that's right. That's an inscription. That's an inscription. That's it, baby. Oh, oh, oh. There's an omega, clear as day. There's a C, delta, eta. Yeah, okay. The inscription is in Greek 
the dominant language of the wealthy in Jerusalem in the first century AD. But what does it say? Yahweh is God's name, Yahweh in Greek. Yahweh. In English, it's pronounced Jehovah. So, that would be a verb. God is doing something. This and this I can't get. The team contacts Professor James Charlesworth to help decipher the Greek inscription. You were supposed to arrive yesterday, but you have a bit yeah. of a cold. Mm -hmm. Yesterday would be no good. We didn't now need a Greek uh, reader yesterday, but we do today. <laughs> okay, you're not, you're not going to believe Come uh, Are you teasing me? What, yeah, come on, come on. What have we got? And in the middle area between the two rosettes, you've got this Greek inscription. All right, I can read Yao. We have this in the Jewish magical papyri <laughs> as a way of referring to Yahweh or God. So here you have it in Greek, in uncios, that means all caps, Yao. And above, I'm suggesting it might be Dios. Uh, God or Zeus is now Yahweh. There you and go. Upso, that would be related to the Greek word upsotheo, to raise up. What? Yeah, yep, that's it. Upsalam, C, and Omega. And that is uncio for upsoo, which in the Gospel of John is used for the resurrection of Jesus. Upsoo, he is lifted up. I am lifted up, says Jesus. I am lifted up. I am raised up. Upsao. And the rest, I'm not sure I can read. A lamath pay. Maybe an olive. It I'm could not be sure. an olive. Uh huh. Uh, Apo. Upsao. Apo Tuthanu, I would guess. From the dead. The first two lines are clear. The first word is Dios, which can be read as Lord or God. The second word, Jehovah the name of God in the Hebrew Bible. And then a word, upso, which can mean has raised, will raise, or is raising. And finally, three letters that are not clear. They could be referencing, as Professor Charlesworth cite read, the realm of death. But the last three letters may actually be A, G, B. The last word then could be Agba, the Hebrew equivalent of Upso. In this case, the inscription is translinear. Greek, Hebrew, Greek, Hebrew. And it reads, God, Jehovah, raise up, raise up. In every reading, it's a plea for resurrection. But there is another possible reading. There's a word that shouldn't be here, Jehovah. In the first century, mainstream Jews would never write God's holy name on an ossuary. That would be heretical. In this case, the inscription can be interpreted as Lord, Jesus, Rise up, rise up. The inscription found here strongly suggests that the people buried in this tomb believed in resurrection. On one level, it could be a plea for their own resurrection. Read in a different way, however, it's an exhortation for Jesus to resurrect himself. For James Tabor, the find is persuasive convincing him that the tomb, just a few hundred feet away, is the ultimate resting place of Jesus and his family. This tomb is given a wider context to the other tomb. Before yesterday, if you had asked me, Talpio, Jesus' tomb, what do you think, 50-50? I was already at 75%. By adding this tomb, I'm up to 95 easily. The implications are enormous. Does the very idea that Jesus' bones were placed here fly in the face of the most fundamental of Christian beliefs in Jesus' resurrection? Not according to Professor Charlesworth. The significance of what we have seen for the first time and any eye has seen for 2,000 years is that we have a whale with a mouth that's closed, not a whale that's swallowing someone. And out of that mouth comes a human being. The symbol here in Jerusalem, near where Jesus was crucified, not far away, 
is a symbol of the belief that Jesus is raised. This is within decades of Jesus' death. I believe that this tomb can be the tomb of Jesus. And what we found in the tomb less than 200 feet away from the Jesus tomb is evidence of that, hard archaeological evidence. They're celebrating his resurrection. So the way you put that together is their understanding is that it's Jesus has been lifted up. He's been exalted to heaven. Not necessarily that his bones went up to heaven. The bones can stay behind. They're like old clothing that you shed. And then you put on the new clothing. Their mission seems completed. Did the team find Joseph of Arimathea? They can't know for sure. But what they do know is that to a cluster of names that they already found compelling, they have now added to the archaeological data what they identify as an image of Jonah. A cross, a Mara inscription, and a first ever resurrection statement. Based on these findings, the team believes that there are compelling reasons to conclude that Talpia Jerusalem is the last resting place of Jesus' earliest followers, most of his family, and of Jesus of Nazareth himself. It will now be up to scholars to weigh the evidence. One thing is for certain, the debate is just beginning.